This actually has been a joint work with Michael Schwarz, who is also here, Daniel Cruz, Samuel Weiser, Clementine Maurice, Raphael Spreitzer, and Stefan Mangard. So let's dive right in. So keystroke timing attacks infer typed words, best phrases, or can create user fingerprints. And in this work, we present two new attacks that allow us to recover keystroke timings. And in the end, we build an effective countermeasure that eliminate all existing side channel based attacks on keystroke timings. So we start off with some background information. As I said, keystroke timing attacks acquire accurate timestamps of keystrokes for input sequences. And they can depend on syllables, bigrams, words, the keyboard layout that is used, and also on the typing experience of the user actually typing. And these attacks exploit the timing characteristics to learn information about the user or the entered text. So they can be used to infer, to infer typed sequences and also to recover best phrases. And in the past, we've seen that there are many ways to obtain those keystroke timings. For instance, network latency, network packet statistics, CPU usage, Wi-Fi signals, also the PROC interrupts interface, JavaScript sensor API, and also cache attacks have been used to obtain the exact moments of time when the user pressed the actual key on the keyboard. As we want to protect against many of them, we also need a little introduction in cache side channel attacks. And they allow us to monitor cache accesses by a victim process. And by the capability of measuring the access time on how long it takes to load an address, one can infer if the address has been loaded into the cache or not. And using specific instructions, an attacker can also remove addresses from the cache. And there are two major attacks called the flush and reload attack, which works on shared memory, for instance, a shared library that is shared among all processes on a computer that works on the user input. And so if the attacker monitors a certain address that is used when an input is entered, he can monitor whenever the user has typed something. While he cannot observe what he is actually typing, he can infer the keystroke timings. Another attack which does not rely on shared memory is the prime and probe attack, but it's much more noisy. But you can mount it if there is no shared memory available. If we take a look at what is really happening on the computer whenever you type a button, first you have an interrupt which gets sent to a CPU core, then there is some code executed in the operating system in the driver, then the pre-processed input is sent forward to the user space library which will then pin out which window the key should be sent to and so on. So there are multiple possibilities for an attacker to observe the input which will bring us to our first new attack, which we call interrupt timing attacks. And the basic idea is that we continuously acquire a high resolution timestamp and just monitor the differences between subsequent timestamps. And this attack just requires unprivileged code execution and an accurate timing source. For instance, the RDDSC instruction on x86, which gives us the cycle counter. And if you would implement that an attack, it's quite easy. You just have a loop and look at how much time has passed since the last measurement. And you will see that significant differences will occur when the process has been interrupted. And the more time the operating system takes to consume and handle the input, the higher the timing differences are, as we can see in this plot. So the user typed here the password password and we see distinct spikes for every character and the exact moment of time when he pressed the character. So we can use this to obtain the exact moments of time. The second attack that we proposed is based on the prime and probe attack, but we call it multi prime and probe attack, where we attack the interrupt handler within the kernel. And with the prime and probe attack, we observe cache activity in the cache sets that are used by this code of the interrupt handler. And since the prime and probe attack is quite noisy, we try to cope with that by running simultaneously prime and probe attacks on different addresses. And with this, we end up with the first highly accurate 
keystroke timing paste attack using Prime and Probe, as we can see in this plot. So using that, we see more active cache sets when the user pressed a key on the keyboard, and therefore we have obtained the exact moments of time again. So now we want to build a countermeasure that protects against all these attacks. And the first thing we need to do, we need to define an attacker from whom we want to protect against. And our attacker has unprivileged code execution on a recently updated system, so he cannot exploit any software vulnerabilities. And the attacker can continuously monitor a side channel to obtain traces for all user inputs. And what we have to remark here is that with side channel attacks, you usually can trigger an event multiple times, multiple times like a signature creation, but for user input, you just cannot do that because you cannot force the user to enter a sentence 300 times. However, for password input, you can do that because the password does not change. So to recover the password, you can actually collect multiple traces of the password. Furthermore, we want to have specific requirements that should be fulfilled by the countermeasure so that it is a good countermeasure and a working countermeasure. The first requirement is we want to minimize the side channel accuracy because keystroke timing attacks highly require a high precision and a high recall. And if we can change that, then the attacker cannot observe that many events or even observe wrong events. For the second case where an attacker can collect multiple traces for the same input, he could exploit statistical characteristics of the password input. And for this case, what we want to do is we want to reduce these characteristics and increase the number of traces that are required for the attacker to reconstruct the exact moments of time where the keystroke has happened. And studies have shown that users have roughly between one and five different passwords that they enter a password like five times a day, and they change their passwords, 56% uh, of them change their passwords within half a year. So an attacker could obtain in this time 900 traces. The last thing that is important for the countermeasure is that it should not open up new side channels if it's implemented. So the implementation needs to be secure as well. And if all of these requirements are met, then the side channel attack in presence of the countermeasure is not practical anymore. So a simplistic approach to implement such a countermeasure would be if we have seen earlier what sources have been used to obtain the exact moments of time to just restrict the unprivileged access to certain APIs or statistics interfaces. And this has been done already, so we consider that out of scope. But furthermore, as we have seen, for instance, with the interrupt-based side channel attack, we have different side channels that we need to cope with. So this is not a solution. The other thing is that we could just restrict high-resolution timers, like the unprivileged RDDC instruction cannot be used anymore, but we've seen in the past that you can easily build your own timer with a high resolution that you can use, also in the, in the web using JavaScript. And the idea here of us is what we do instead, we add a lot of noise by randomly injecting fake keystrokes. And as I said earlier, normally you shouldn't do that for side channel attacks because you can trigger an event multiple times and then average out the noise. But for user input sequences, this is special and there, this is a good approach which leads us to Keydrown. So Keydrown is our multi-layered countermeasure that injects fake keystrokes quite at the beginning with a keystroke interrupt, and the event travels then through the entire software stack, covering all points an attacker can use to observe the event. So the first layer therefore protects against the interrupt-based attacks and also timing-based attacks by artificially injecting interrupts. And we continuously, at random moments of time, inject a fake interrupt, and when a real interrupt occurs, we just replace the next scheduled fake one with this one. If we would just periodically inject a fake interrupt, like every 50 milliseconds, an attacker could easily observe the pattern and would then figure out which one has been the real key press and which one has been the fake one. And our implementation ensures that over time, the interrupt density is uniform 
so he doesn't see multiple interrupts in a small amount where the real interrupt has happened. And what we did is we implemented that as a kernel module for Linux and therefore also for Android. And the kernel module handles hardware interrupts from the input device and also from a timer. And if it observes a timer interrupt, it will inject a new keyboard interrupt. And on the other hand, if it observes a real keyboard interrupt, it will inject a non-periodic one-shot timer with a random delay to then inject the next fake keystroke. And so for real and fake keystrokes, the same interrupts occur. For the second layer, where we want to protect the user space libraries against flush and reload or prime and probe attacks. And when we inject a keystroke, the real and the injected keys, keystroke should have the same code paths and also the same data accesses in the library. But we inject valid keystrokes, which are not used normally, like a media pattern event. And therefore, it's possible that it has slightly different code paths through the library. And what we do here is we duplicate this key, randomize the value to a normal value, like in a character, and send it to a hidden window. So both events travel through the user space library simultaneously, covering all the code paths that an attacker could use to monitor if it has been a fake or real keystroke. Last, we also need to protect the buffer itself where the password is stored, because an attacker could, mo could mount a prime and probe attack on that buffer, and therefore what we do is we just generate the same cache activity on the cache lines that are used by the buffer independently if we receive a real or fake keystroke. And this mitigates prime and probe attacks on the buffer. For the evaluation of our countermeasure, we use the uniform key injection interval between 0 and 20 milliseconds, and any real key will replace a fake scheduled key injection. So the distribution of the real keystrokes in these 20 milliseconds will be uniform over time. And also the interrupt density function will be uniform with 100 events per second. In order to compare the results on how effective the side channels are when the countermeasure is active, and when it's not active, we compare the results using the F-score against a always one oracle and a random oracle, so that we see using the side channel, you are not better than just randomly guessing if it has been a real or fake keystroke. And if the side channel with the countermeasure active yields an F-score with the same value of 0.15 or below, we know that an attacker cannot observe any additional information by using the side channel. Here we see a flush and reload attack on the libgdk, and on the left we see with an F-score of 0.99, we can exactly extract the exact moments of time where the event has happened, and on the right where we see many fake injected keystrokes, we reduce the F-score to 0.09. The same applies for the prime and probe attack, where we attack the interrupt handler, so we reduce the F-score by activating key drown from 0.81 to 0.11, and also for the interrupt attack that I've showed you, with an F-score of 0.94, we can easily detect each event, but with Keydrown active, we reduce the F-score to 0.14. So for the second requirement, where an attacker can acquire multiple traces to average out the noise, we model a very powerful attacker to figure out how many traces he can actually get and compare that to our 900 traces in the beginning. So we assume that this attacker has a noise-free side channel. So he can only observe a real event, a fake event, and no system noise. So a sy system noise does not trigger any events. He's also capable of perfectly realigning all of the traces. Even after he pinpoint one event, he can realign all the other traces based on that and he knows the actual length of the password and expects as many characters. So this attacker is far stronger than any actual attacker. And what we did, we simulated a typing variance of 40 milliseconds, which has been reported to be accurate for trained text sequences, so a password you type over and over again, so it's a trained text sequence, and we generated 300,000 traces with eight keystrokes in two seconds. 
And then we figured out how many traces you actually need to randomly choose from these 300,000 traces to combine and average out to get the exact moments of time, and it's 2,500 almost. So it's much more than the 900. So when you change your password within six months, you should be safe also under the assumption of this very strong attacker. The last thing we need to make sure is that our implementation is secure. So for the first layer, it's a kernel module, so it runs in kernel, and we can only attack it with a prime and probe attack. And in general, the execution flow and the data accesses should be the same for the real injection of the, inter uh, for the interrupt of the real keystroke and the fake keystroke. But for the few derivations that we have in the code, we just make sure that we also access this data for the non-executed paths. For the second layer, where we want to protect the user space library or the user space application, this could be theoretically be attacked by a flash and reload attack. But the second layer itself does not know whether the event has been a fake event or a real event, so an attacker does not gain any additional information by attacking this user space application. And for the third layer, the same applies, because we um, generate cache activity independently if the event has been a real keystroke or a fake keystroke. To conclude, we presented two new attacks, the interrupt-based attack and the multi-prime and probe attack. We presented Keytron, which is a new defense mechanism against keystroke timing attacks, which randomly injects keystrokes, and it has a performance overhead of 2.5% for the Parsec-3 benchmark and 6.9% for the LMN benchmark. As we also implemented that for Android, we have seen an increase on average of the battery consumption of 4.6% when the countermeasure is active. With Keydrown, attackers are not capable to distinguish fake from real keystrokes anymore, and therefore we are saved against keystroke timing attacks. And Keydrown also eliminates any advantage that an attacker has from using a software-based side channel attack. Thank you, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We, we have a, a room for a few questions. If you want to ask a question, please come front. Okay, I guess I will start one question. So uh, my question is about uh, your, your defense mechanism. Okay. I think it's basically, uh, it's, it's very interesting and you in, inject lots of these force uh, keystrokes into the system. So I wonder if it's possible like the other legitimate apps pick up your uh, keystrokes and uh, if the legitimate, legitimate apps functionalities got uh, disrupted by your uh, force keystrokes. Yes, so, so the idea is that we have for the injected keystroke, we use a send code, which is a valid key, like the media key, which is normally not used in any application. So this will travel up to the final application, but actually won't do anything. So you, you wouldn't add this to, to the password buffer. But if you would enter a character, it will also travel up, and then this character will be appended to the buffer. So the normal other applications are not really influenced by that. Thank you.